السلام عليكم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته my dear brothers and sisters I would like to uh, ask my brothers and sisters uh, to be uh, seated please uh, to save the time and to use it the most official way if we can start now please let's recite the last salawat Allahumma salli ala Muhammad I would love to thank all of you for being with us tonight and I thank you uh, for answering the call of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and share these very important days and nights for mourning, learning and uh, how to be like Hussein inshallah to make us to be inshallah after these programs. These kind of nights are es uh, essential for all of us, for all the human, human beings, I would say. In particular, the lovers of Ahlul Bayt. So I really thank you for being with us tonight. And inshallah, we will continue these programs for another 10 more nights. And we would love to see you all here, inshallah, every night. Uh, before I begin, a uh, couple announcements. Well, first and most important thing, my dear brothers and sisters, I know having a mask on is not that comfortable. But, uh, you know, the board, we sat down and we talked. We thought it's the best thing to do is uh, to wear one of these in order to protect everybody here. Because we don't want to see any one of our mu'mineen brothers and sisters to have any issues, health-wise and other things. So we would love to see you here, please, inside the mosque at least wearing a mask, and it will be very appreciated. And uh, we have some teachers upstairs now, two teachers upstairs. If you have children, if you can keep them under your control, they'll be perfect. Because I believe what you and I are today is because our parents brought us to these kind of gatherings. And we heard and we stored. Although you may think they will not be hearing and understanding, no, they would. Definitely they would be understanding and learning from this very young age. They just store it, they store the information. So if they want to be here, they are more than welcome to be with us as long as they are under the parents' control. But if you can't, we have two, uh, two classes upstairs with two teachers, they're gonna be there momentarily. You can send them there, please and that's very appreciated. And we need sponsors for these nights. Uh, we're trying our best to provide the best service and the best uh, programs here, but we need your help, definitely. Help as much as you can. It doesn't have to be sponsoring the whole night. If you sponsor the whole night, it will be very appreciated, definitely. But if you can sponsor part of the night, I'll be here after the program. Mr. Mushtaba is gonna be here. Inshallah, we'll take your help. And uh, there's a, for the first year, actually we are doing this Kids Muharram Workshop. Uh, kids from eight to 16 years of age, they can be here uh, from Monday to Friday, August 1st to August 5th, during the day from uh, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, there's gonna be uh, speakers for them, and they're gonna learn a lot. And already there are some who have registered and uh, they promised to be here with their kids. Oh, they're bringing their kids. And we have ladies weekends. This weekend, tomorrow, and day after tomorrow, our ladies, just ladies, that's for only ladies, our ladies here. Again, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And, uh, you know, we will put some, I heard that you need to have the, the best privacy possible. We're gonna cover those glasses over there during the program and might, we might take them off. It would be a little bit of work for our uh, volunteers, but they are more than happy to do that for you. So please, uh, uh, you can come here from tomorrow and the after tomorrow, and of course, the next weekend as well. Uh, for the nights that we have uh, sponsors, we already had a couple nights or so, and let's go ahead and recite, because some, most of them said do not mention the name because Allah knows. We're gonna recite Surah Al-Fatiha for the soul of their loved ones who passed away. And inshallah, we pray for Allah, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow them the best of paradise 
uh, over there, inshallah. Uh, so let's recite the Fatiha for the ones who sponsored, for their family members who passed away, the families that sponsored these nights. Ma'a salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki yawm al-Din. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ihdana as-sirat al-mustaqim. Sirat al-lazina an'amta alayhim. Ghayr al-maadubi alayhim. Wa al-dallin. Sadaq Allahu al-Aliyu al-Azim. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم من كان يريد العجلة عجلنا له في ما نشاء من نريد ثم جعلنا له جهنم يصلاها يصلاها مذموما مدحورا وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَأُولَئِكَ وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَأُولَئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مشكورا كلا نمد هؤلاء وهؤلاء من عطاء وما كان عطاء ربك محظورا انظروا كيف فضلنا بعضهم على بعض انظر كيف فضلنا بعضهم على بعض ولا الآخرة أكبر درجات وأكبر تفضيلا لا تجعل مع الله إذا آخر فتقعد مذموما مخذولا وقضى ربك ألا تعبدوا إلا إياه وبالوالدين إحسانا إما يبلغ عندك الكبر أحدهما أو كلاهما فلا تقل له فلا تقل لهما أف ولا تنهرهما وقل لهما قولا كريما 
وَفِضْلَهُ مَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ وَقُلْ رَبِّ ارْحَمُ بَاكَ مَا رَبَّيَانِي صَغِيرًا صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ A quick over, uh, very quick, like translation thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning says, about the people who want just this world, Allah says, we will give them. But they're not going to have a chance in the hereafter. And there are some people who want the, the akhara, that their tries and their efforts are going to be thanked. And at last, the, the last two verses that I recited, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have decreed to the humans to not worship anyone except their Lord. And immediately says, ihsana means doing good to the parents. Very quick elaboration about ihsan and khair. Although my teacher is here, Samahat al-Sayyid Muhammad al baqir we're honored to have him this night. Uh, we, we really are happy to see him here tonight and the other nights that we're going to have programs. Ihsan is a little bit above and beyond khair. Example, and I'll be done. I don't want to take too much of your time because I would love to hear our dear brother Muhammad Baqir Khazwini to be talking to us. When I feel like my mother needs something, when I see my father needs something, because of their pride, they don't ask us. They don't ask us. Because they want to keep their pride. If I go on my own and uh, fulfill that need that they have, this is called ihsan. So if my mother told me, bring this, and I brought it, I haven't done that much, actually. When I feel, when I see them, they need something. My, our parents need, some, we need us for something. When we go and do that for them, fulfill that need of theirs, it becomes ihsan. Salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So help me invite, oh, yeah, please, of course, of course, Muhammad. I'm sorry, Muhammad. I called your brother yesterday, Muhammad, but, uh, but it's okay. I know you forgive me. Yeah, we're going to have Muhammad Qazwini, the son of our, the, our imam of the center here. He's going to be talking to us for about seven, eight, maybe ten minutes. And I love also to hear from him as well. For his health and inviting him to the podium, please recite Allah Salawat. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيما السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Thank you, Hajj Hamir, for the uh, very amazing introduction. And the topic I'm going to be talking about tonight is one of the lessons that we learn from our Imam, Imam Hussein. Now, originally, I wanted to take a couple of the lessons that we learned from him and put it into one lecture. But upon doing my research, I realized that the Imam has so much knowledge to give us that it's not possible to put multiple of, it, of his lessons in 10 minutes. So I chose the first one, which was to never allow oneself to be humiliated. Now the first time we see the Imam talk about this is truly in the turning point of the story of Karbala. When Al-Hur has his army and he is stopping the Imam and his caravan from going to Kufa. At that point, the Imam knows it is time to resign his fate. He is heading to Karbala, and he is heading towards his death. So he turns to his companions, and he tells them, O oh my companions, I have been left with two options. Either my humiliation or my death. 
and by God I cannot choose my humiliation. He is telling his companions here, I am going towards my death, and if you come with me, you are also going towards your death. Now, for Imam Hussein, humiliation was much more weighty than it is for us. Humiliation for him meant the end of the religion of his grandfather. If he gave in to Yazid ibn Muawiyah, it would be the end of the religion of his grandfather. It would be over. For us, it's not as powerful, but we can still draw lessons from Imam Hussein. What is the lesson that we can draw from him? When the Imam is talking about humiliation, he truly means going away from the morals that you have been taught by the Ahlul Bayt, by his grandfather the Prophet, and by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means that in the West, we face a ton of temptations on a daily basis that are, to, that are going to stray us away from our religion. Humiliation means giving in to those temptations and not staying true to your path. Because truly, that is the biggest failure that we can face. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, لَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُ الْحُسْنَ وَزِيَادَ لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُ الْحُسْنَ وَزِيَادَ وَلَا يَرْهَقُ وَجُوهُهُمْ قَطَرٌ وَلَا ذِلَّةٌ أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ الْجَنَّةِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ He's talking about the people who do good in this life. The people that do good in this life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that we will, not, we, will, we will not cover their faces in dirt and in humiliation and we will allow them to enter paradise. They will enter paradise with their heads raised high and a smile on their face as they meet their Lord. So we know what we should be doing in this life, what we should be following. But the question comes up, what happens if you veer from the path. What happens if you make a mistake? Is it the end of the road? Is that it? Are you condemned to hell? No. Again, we'll look to the Quran for our answer. And the Quran tells us of a story of the Prophet Yunus in Surah Al-Anbiya. It begins, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَذِنْ نُونِ إِذْ ذَهَبَ مُغَاضِبًا فَظَنَّ أَنْ لَنْ نَقْدِرَ عَلَيْهِ فنادى في الظلمات أن لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين فاستجبنا له ونجيناه من الغم وكذلك ننجي المؤمنين. The Prophet Yunus, after preaching to his people for so long and them not listening, became angry. In a conversation with God, he said, I'm done. I'm leaving. They don't want to listen to me. So why am I preaching to them? I'm leaving. God had told him, no, you have to stay with your people. But he said, I'm not listening. I'm gone. So where did he end up? In the belly of a whale. And in that moment, sitting in the darkness, the Quran tells us, he was in the veil of darkness and he cried out, there is no God worthy of worship but you. Glory be to you, I have certainly been wrong. And Allah tells him, so we answered his prayer and rescued him from anguish. And so do we save the true believers. He was in the belly of a whale. Usually if you're in the belly of a whale, you give up hope. It's over. You're not getting out of that. But he raised his hands to Allah and he said, God, I have nothing left but you. You're all that's left for me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him from the belly of that whale. So if God saved the Prophet Yunus from the belly of a whale, what makes us think that we're not worthy of being saved. Are our problems worse than disobeying a direct order from Allah? I don't think so. So we've established that making a mistake isn't the worst thing in the world. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects us to make mistakes. The word insan, the Arabic word for human being, comes from the root word nisyan, forgetfulness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala named us forgetful because He knows we're going to make mistakes. It's expected from us. What matters is how you deal with these mistakes. So we go back to the man that the story began with. Al-Hurr ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. They say, that on the day of Ashura, Al-Hur was walking around confused in a daze and he was shaking. 
So one of the people from the army came and they told him, Oh, Hur, you are the bravest man in this army. If somebody asked me, point out the bravest man in this army, I would point to you. Why are you shaking? And he said, I see myself walking a thin line between paradise and hellfire. And by God, I will choose nothing but paradise. So what does he do? He gets on his horse and he rides to the camp of Imam Hussein. He goes to the temp- camp of Imam Hussein and he tells him, Oh my master, my, may I enter? Imam Hussein tells him, Who is this? He says, I am Hur. I am the one who brought you here. I am the one who brought your family and your companions to a slaughter. But I have realized now that I am wrong. I have realized my mistake and I am afraid that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put me in the hellfire for this mistake. Imam Hussein tells him, if you want to be saved from the hellfire, then go fight and protect my family. So he does exactly that. Al-Hur goes out to the battlefield and he fights bravely until he is struck down. He fights bravely until he is struck down. And Imam Hussein comes to him as he is bleeding out. And he puts his head in his lap and he tells him, Hur, you were named correctly. Hur, your mother named you a free man and truly you are a free man in this life and in the hereafter. We are talking about a man who sentenced the family of the Prophet to death. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him. Why? Because with a pure heart, he begged Allah for forgiveness and he sacrificed his life in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah's mercy stretches to somebody who has made that kind of mistake, then why doesn't Allah's mercy stretch to you? Why are your sins too big for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So my brothers and sisters, what do we learn from the battle of Karbala? We learn that A, do not humiliate yourself. But even if you have, pick yourself back up. It's not the end of the road. Pick yourself back up and with a clean heart, beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Say, oh Allah, I have wronged myself. I see that now but I am actively trying to fix it. So please accept from me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept from you. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah wa ala al-arwah allati hallat bi finaika wa anakhat bi rahlik alaykum minni jami'an salamullah abadan ma baqitu wa baqiya al-layl wa al-nahar wa la ja'alahu allahu akhara al-ahdi minni li ziyaratikum assalamu ala al-husayn وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته والفاتحة مع صلاة على محمد وآل محمد أحسن سيد محمد من الله بلس إن شاء الله وبركاته وإن شاء الله وإن شاء الله so now please help me and invite our dear brother Sayyid Muhammad Baq al Qazmi to the podium with Allah Salawat, please. على حب الحسين صلوا على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت 
wa baqiya al-layl wan-nahar respected brothers and sisters assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh i sincerely extend to you my condolences on the arrival of the month of muharram the month of tragedy the month of grief and sorrow but also the month of inspiration it is my great honor to be with you during these nights i had the honor to be amongst this wonderful community four years ago and i look forward to this muharram season as we are together on this journey to be inspired by the master of the free the master of the martyrs al-imam abi abdullah al-hussein salawatullahi alayhi allahumma salli ala muhammad allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the holy quran in surah al-buruj bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim qutila ashab al-ukhdud النار ذات الوقود صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد the greatest tragedy that has ever struck humankind is the tragedy of Karbala the tragedy of Imam Hussein عليه السلام this is the most inspirational story that has inspired millions of people throughout history Every year we live the story, we breathe the story. This story teaches us how to love, how to sacrifice, how to better ourselves, how to better our communities. It is by far the most effective story that has touched our lives and inspired us. But have you ever wondered, where did we get the information about the story over the years a very common question that I'm always asked is how did we get all the details of the battle of Karbala who narrated these details for us what was the equivalent of CNN in those times were there reporters there telling us these stories is it a single narrator who narrated all these events to us was it the survivors who lived to tell the world what happened in Karbala? This is our story. This is the most important story that we interact with. So how did we get the details about the battle of Karbala? What are the sources for this greatest tragedy in the history of humankind? In our discussion tonight, we will examine how we received information about the battle of Karbala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran teaches us to document tragedies. If someone asks you, why is it that you put so much emphasis on a battle, on an event that took place 14 centuries ago? What's the big deal? Why are you stuck in the past? Why is it that every single year you gather and you spend so much time, energy, efforts, money to remember the story? Is there a Quranic foundation for that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in the Holy Quran to document tragedies. Look at Surah Al-Buruj. In Surah Al-Buruj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in a very emotional way. It stirs up your emotions, your sense of justice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, قُتِلَ أَصْحَابُ الْأُخْدُودِ The people of the ditch have been killed. النَّارِ ذَاتُ الْوَقُودِ The flames, the fires were lit and they were burned to death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this beautiful chapter teaches us that when an act of injustice happens document it don't let it go don't let it be forgotten many many centuries ago before the religion of islam 
there was an evil king in Yemen by the name of Dhu Nuas. He started to persecute Christians who were on the path of Prophet Isa alayhi salam. He tried to force them to give up their faith. They refused. So you know what he did? He created a huge ditch, a trench, and he lit it with fire. And he told them, either you give up your faith or I will burn you alive. What would you do in that case? Seriously. No, this is this world. I have a family. I have a job. I have so many things to take care of. But there were mu'mineen, believers who were so firm in their love for Allah and for Prophet Isa alayhi salam, they said, we will not give up our faith. Because if we give up our faith, we're dead. There is no life without faith. And we're not going to let you take our spiritual life. We shall remain steadfast on the path of Prophet Isa alayhi salam. He burned them alive. According to some reports, he burned some 20,000 of them in the famous land of Najran, northern Yemen. Allah documents this in the Holy Quran. If it weren't for the documentation of the Quran, this tragedy would have been lost. Christians don't even know about this tragedy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us, document a tragedy. Today in your society, in our world, if we see a tragedy, write about it, post about it. You will receive a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is a Quranic principle. And therefore, when we come to the story of Karbala, we see that after the story of, of Karbala, a new genre emerged and gained tract. And this genre is called the Maqatil or the Maqtal. Many Maqtals were written after the Battle of Karbala. In Arabic, the word Maqtal basically means the place of killing or the time of killing. After the Battle of Karbala, we see that many historians try to document what happened. What happened in this land? Despite the censorship of the Umayyads, the story of Karbala generated so much interest. It garnered so much attention during those times. And so you see a new genre emerge after Karbala called the Maqatil. These books that documented what happened in Karbala. And it is these sources that preserved for us the details of what happened on the day of Ashura, before the day of Ashura, after the day of Ashura. The journey of Imam Hussein السلام, from Medina from, to Mecca to Karbala. It is these sources that preserved for us these important details that we, after 14 centuries, we sit and we reflect on. And we are inspired by this amazing story of Karbala. Now by far, the most important of these works, of these maqatil, is the maqtal of Abu Mikhnaf. You might be familiar with this name. My dear brothers and sisters, if it weren't for this maqtal, many of the details that you hear about during these nights would have been lost in history. It is this great work that preserved many of the details of the story of Karbala. So on such a night, let's spend some time to know the significance of the source and who is the author of this maqtal. The author of this maqtal is a man by the name of Lut ibn Yahya. He was born around the beginning of the second century of the Hijra calendar. This is about three to four decades after Karbala, a century after the Prophet ﷺ. And he lived in Kufa. He died in the year 157 in the Hijri calendar, or some say the year 170. So you're looking at the era of Imam al-Sadiq or the era of Imam al-Kadhim Abu Mikhnaf came from a very important tribe. His grandfather, Mikhnaf ibn Sulaym, was a prominent companion of the Prophet a companion of Amir al-Mu'mineen He supported Imam Ali at the Battle of Jamal, at the Battle of Nahrawan, at the Battle of Safin. 
And Imam Ali السلام, appointed his grandfather to be the governor of Isfahan. So he comes from a very prominent family. Abu Mikhnaf turned out to be the most prominent historian of Iraq during that era. He authored some 30 books about the history of Iraq and the battles that took place and the conquests that took place. But by far the most important of his works is the maqtal that he wrote about Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He wrote this maqtal about 60 to 70 years about after the event of Karbala. Now Abu Mikhnaf, unfortunately, we don't have his book today. His book did not survive. It was in circulation probably until the 4th century in the Hijri calendar. And then it basically stopped circulating. Not only this book, but all of his books. He wrote some 30 books. None of them survived in history. You would be surprised, my dear brothers and sisters, to know that most books did not survive in history. The books that we have today, they're the minority of books that made it. Most books would maybe circulate for a century or two, and then they would be lost due to so many factors. Natural factors, political factors, social factors, economic factors. None of the books of Abu Mikhnaf survived. So if none of his books survived and his maqtal did not survive, how do we have it today? Today you will find books published in the seminaries called the maqtal of Imam Hussein salam by Abu Mikhnaf. Historians who came after Abu Mikhnaf, they preserved a lot of the content of his books. So his actual book, we don't have today. But other historians like Tabari, the famous Sunni historian, he has preserved some of the content of Abu Mikhnaf's books. That's why you find a Tabari narrates some 600 reports from Abu Mikhnaf. So today, scholars are able to reconstruct his maqtal by looking at early history books who narrated from him, who copied from him, and that's how we have the details today. Now today, unfortunately, there are some extremist Muslims influenced by the Salafis and the Wahhabis. They tell you, yeah, this Abu Mikhnaf is not even reliable. We don't trust him. And he's, he was a Shia. They try to discredit him. There is a discussion on whether Abu Mikhnaf was a Shia or not. Many researchers believe he was not a Shia. Yes, he loved the Ahlul Bayt salam. He despised the Umayyads. But Abu Mikhnaf was not a Shia. Ibn Abil Hadid, the famous Mu'tazili Sunni scholar who has a commentary on Nahj al-Balagha, he makes it very clear. He says Abu Mikhnaf believed that Imama leadership is by election. People choose the Imam, not God. This clearly is not a Shi'i belief. Shi'as believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who appoints the Imams. And then he says, Abu Mikhnaf was not a Shia, nor was he considered amongst the Shia men or historians. And that's why you find Sunni historians like Tabari narrate from him. So there are some people today who will try to discredit him because he narrates what the Umayyads did. And even until today, there are people who want to defend what Yazid did, what Muawiyah did. So they'll tell you, yeah, he was a Shia, we can't trust him. Otherwise, the early historians all trusted Abu Mikhnaf. So a lot of the details that we have, my dear brothers and sisters, from the land of Karbala come from this book that he authored. And so many historians after him, they took the content of his book and they published it. And that's how we know today what happened in Karbala. Now Abu Mikhnaf, he had sources that he relied on. Because he came after the battle of Karbala. He wasn't born yet. So what were his sources? You find that Abu Mikhnaf narrates from about 40 people. These are his sources when it comes to what happened in Karbala. Some of them were direct eyewitnesses who were present there in Karbala. He lived to meet them and he narrates from them. I'll share with you two examples. The first example is a man by the name of Uqba or Aqaba 
Ibn Sam'an. Aqaba Ibn Sam'an was a slave owned by al rabab the wife of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. I know what some of you are wondering now. Did you just say that the wife of Imam Hussein alayhi salam owned a slave? Is that even possible? Is that even moral? My dear brothers and sisters, there's no family in the history of humankind who liberated and educated and emancipated and enriched slaves like the family of Ahlul Bayt Yes, the family of Ahlul Bayt would buy slaves, they would educate them, they would empower them, and then they would free them. According to one report, Al-Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam, he freed 100,000 slaves during his lifetime. Can you imagine this number? 100,000 slaves. He'd buy them and then he would educate them. The Imam alayhi salam would share with them his wisdom, his knowledge, his supplications. After one year, the Imam alayhi salam would release them. The Imam would emancipate them. Some of these slaves, on the day of their emancipation, which should be the happiest day in the life of a slave, they would come. They would fall at the feet of Imam Zain al Abidin. They would beg him. They tell him, Our master, our educator, please don't free us. We're addicted to your kindness, we're addicted to your goodness. <coughs> we cannot find anyone who's going to give us such kindness. They would beg the Imam not to let them go. But the Imam alayhi salam would emancipate them <coughs> and he would dispatch them. The Imam would send them to many, many parts of the Muslim world to go and counter the injustice and the corruption of the Umayyads. And Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam freed 100,000 slaves. The Ahlul Bayt would take these slaves, they'd give them honor, dignity, and then they would emancipate them. So one of those men who was present in Karbala was a man owned by the wife of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He tells us about the journey of Imam Hussein alayhi salam from Medina to Mecca to Karbala. He narrates many of these incidents. For instance, one of the famous incidents that Uqba ibn Sam'an narrates, he says when Imam Hussein was on his way to Iraq, he stopped at a village called the Menzil of Abi Muqatil. The Imam السلام, he stopped at this village, at this place. He says, I saw Imam Al Hussein السلام, he took a short nap. In the Menzil of Bani Muqatil, he took a short nap. And then when he woke up, he started to say, Inna lillah. We saw that the Imam was very disturbed. So his son Ali al Akbar looks at his father. He tells him, Father, why have you said that? Yes, we all shall go back to Allah, but why did you say that? Did something happen? He told him, Yes, my son, just now I took a nap and I heard a call saying, Al Qawmu Yasirun wal Manaya Tasiru ilayhim. I heard someone calling and saying, they are moving, meaning the caravan of Imam Hussein, and death is following them. My dear son, our time is coming near. They had not arrived Karbala yet. They were close to Karbala. My dear son, this is our fate. That's why I said, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. This was a sign from Allah to me that our fate has become near. Ali al-Akbar at this point, he asks his father an amazing question. He tells him, Father, when we will die, will we be on the haqq? Will we be on the truth? <coughs> How will we die? In the state of the truth? Al Imam al Hussein alayhi salam tells him, Yes, my son, we will die in truth. Listen to the words of Ali al-Akbar. Some Uqba ibn Sam'an, he narrates this. He says, I heard Ali ibn al-Akbar say to his father, Father, if we're going to die in truth, then who cares? Whether we fall on death or death falls on us, it does not matter. Because we will die in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Imam al Hussein was so proud to hear this from his son Ali al Akbar. And he told him, May Allah bless you, my dear son. You are the best son to me to say these words. And this is a beautiful lesson for us. One of the greatest sources of anxiety that we have in our lives is because we are not sure of our path. Think about it. We're not sure where am I going, my life, my activities. Is it in the obedience of Allah or not? I'm not sure. I have a lot of shortcomings. I don't put my full hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That causes me grief and anxiety. But if I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is satisfied with me, I know I'm with the truth. You think you'd worry? It's like having comprehensive car insurance, right? You don't care what happens to the car. Imagine if I tell you, here's a car. Go to this, uh, you know, dangerous place in downtown LA or San Francisco these days, you know. A lot of crimes are happening in these places. Go there and you have comprehensive insurance. Don't worry. Your car is stolen. Your car is vandalized. It doesn't matter. We'll replace it the same day with a newer, better car. Would you care? Would you be concerned? If you have to go to downtown and get something done, would you be concerned? You would not care. You're covered. A true believer who's on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always covered. That's the lesson that Ali al-Akbar makes over here for us. He's teaching us when you're on the path of God, it doesn't matter what people say. It does not matter what happens to you. You're in the care of the manager of the universe. Imagine, imagine this universe. Many of you saw the pictures that were released by NASA. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is micromanaging this universe. When you're with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the entire universe is also with you. Because Allah is running the entire universe. It doesn't matter. One day, one of the companions of Imam Rada alayhi salam, by the name of Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman, he came to see the Imam. As soon as he came to see Imam Rada alayhi salam, the Imam told him, a delegation right now arrived from Basra, Iraq. They're going to speak to me. I don't want them to see you here. There is another room. There's a curtain. Go behind the curtain. Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman, he goes behind the curtain. The delegation enters. They meet the Imam and he's hearing them. He realizes it's, it's, it's his friends from Basra. So now he's interested in the conversation that's going to take place with Imam Rada alayhi salam. Suddenly Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman, he's shocked, he's devastated. He hears his friends coming from Basra to see the Imam and they start attacking Yunus. They start spreading rumors against him. In the presence of who? Imam Rada alayhi salam. <coughs> Sometimes the human being loses his shame. Before Allah, <coughs> before the Imam, he's willing to do anything. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. <coughs> he's devastated. When they leave, the Imam alayhi salam calls on him. He comes from behind the curtain. The Imam sees him, he's, he's in tears. The Imam tells him, why are you crying, Yunus? He tells him, Imam, you heard what they said. Did you hear their rumors? The way they attacked me? The, the jealousy that they have towards me, of course I'm devastated. These are my friends. I did not expect this from them. How many times have many people gone through this, right? We've all experienced this. The Imam salam teaches him a very beautiful lesson here. The Imam salam tells him, Oh Yunus, if you are carrying pearls, diamonds in your hand, and the people say there's dung in your hand. Does that change the reality? Does that turn the diamond into dung? It doesn't. And if you're carrying dung in your hand and the people say, no, no, you have diamonds in your hand. Is that going to change the reality? He says, no. The Imam salam says, oh Yunus, if Allah and your Imam is satisfied with you, don't care about the people. Who cares what the people say? I, your Imam, I'm satisfied with you. My dear brothers and sisters, there's nothing sweeter than to know that you've satisfied the Imam of your time. 
when you know Allah is satisfied with you, the Imam is satisfied with you. Who cares about what my cousin and my friend and my community and my neighbor, what they say about me, doesn't matter. You're covered. You're with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we find that this man who was owned by Ar-Rabab, he narrates this incident, this conversation that happened between Ali al-Akbar and Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So he is one of the narrators of what happened in Karbala. He was there from the beginning to the end. So on the day of Ashura, they capture him. When the battle was over, they capture him. They wanted to kill him. So he told Umar ibn Sa'd, the commander of Yazid's army, he told him, look, I'm not a free man, I'm a slave. And basically, I did not come here by my choice. So they released him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the success to stay after Karbala to narrate what happened. One of the myths that Uqba ibn Sam'an was able to debunk is the following. The army of Yazid started to spread rumors that Imam Hussein weakened. Imam Hussein alayhi salam became weak at the end and he begged Umar ibn Sa'ad to take him to Yazid so he can pledge allegiance. They started to spread this rumor. Uqba ibn Sam'an, he lived to debunk the smith. He said, no, I was present there and I'll tell you exactly what Imam Hussein said. Till the last minute, he would say, Hayat min nadhillah. He rejected humiliation. Till the last minute, he was a warrior who would fight. He never was weakened. So he's one of the survivors who narrates to us some of the events that happened in Karbala. Abu Nikh Mikhnaf directly narrates from him. So here's, here's one of the sources. Another source that we have is Dilham, the daughter of Amr, the wife of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn. She also narrates to us some of the details that happened on the way to Karbala. Abu Mikhnaf says, I met her. I told her, can you tell me how your husband, Zuhair ibn al-Qayn, joined Imam Hussein alayhi salam? She says, yes, I'll tell you. We were sitting in the tents and my husband Zuhair was not interested in meeting Imam Hussein. He was influenced by, you know, the Uthmanis and he did not want to join Imam al Hussein alayhi salam on the way to Karbala. He had just finished his Hajj. He was going back to Iraq. Imam Hussein camped in the same village as Zuhair ibn al Qayn. So the messenger from Imam Hussein comes into the tent of Zuhair ibn al Qayn and he tells him, Imam Hussein wants to meet you. Please rise and come. His wife narrates, she says he was about to eat. He became so agitated. Why did you have to call on me? So he refused. He told the messenger of Imam Hussein, go. I don't want to go and see the Imam. Imagine Abu Abdullah calling you. At that point, Dulham, she could not stand this scene. The grandson of Rasulullah calls on you and you say no to him? Impossible. She tells him, Zuhair, what's the matter with you? How will you have the face to see his grandfather on the day of judgment? Hussein is calling on you? Get up and see what he wants from you. Subhanallah, that motivates him. And he gets up to meet Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. One of the greatest blessings Allah can give you, brothers and sisters, is a spouse who reminds you of your mistakes. I know sometimes we get defensive, right? When you commit a mistake, when you do something wrong, your wife, your husband points it out to you, you get defensive, you get angry, especially husbands. Let's, let's face it, right? If you do something wrong and your wife points it out, you don't like it. Take that as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah has blessed you with a spouse, who always points out your mistakes, keeps you in check, reminds you of the haqq, fall into sujood and ask Allah for giving you such a spouse. Zuhair ibn al-Qayn would not have become one of the martyrs of Karbala if it weren't for his wife. He goes and he meets Aba Abdullah, he comes back, his face is shining and he tells her, go, I will now send you to your family. I've decided to join Abi Abdullah al Hussein. One meeting, with Imam al Hussein transformed him 180 degrees. She tells him, Oh Zuhair, I have one request from you. I have one request from you. Convey my salam to Imam al Hussein. 
And on the day of judgment, ask his grandfather, Rasulullah, to give me his shafa'ah, to grant me his intercession. So Abu Mikhnaf narrates some of these details from those who witness these events, my dear brothers and sisters. And then we also have someone like Hamid or Humaid ibn Muslim. If you ever wondered if there was a reporter in Karbala narrating these events, yes. There was a man by the name of Humaid or Hamid ibn Muslim. He came to Karbala not to fight. He was not on the side of Imam Hussein. He was on the other side, Umar ibn Sa'd's side. He did not come to fight. He came to document what happens. In today's terms, he was a reporter. He was a journalist. So he comes and he documents what happens in the land of Karbala. Many of the stories that you hear on these nights are narrated from Hamid ibn Muslim. When Tabari narrates what happens in Karbala, about 10% of his reports come from this man, from Hamid or Humaid ibn Muslim. He witnessed these events, the last moments in the life of Imam Hussein and what happened to him. He narrates it. He was standing there. He was watching. What happened to those children? What happened to Al-Qasim, to Ali and Al-Akbar? Humaid ibn Muslim narrates these events. The most heartbreaking story that Hamid ibn Muslim narrates, he says after Imam Hussein was massacred and the tents of the women and the children were set to fire, I saw a little girl. Her garments had caught on fire. And she came running. I felt bad for her. I helped her extinguish the fire. When I extinguished the fire, I asked her, who are you? Can you tell me about your identity? Introduce yourself, who are you? She looked at me and she said, Ya Shaykh, al al Quran. He was puzzled. A, a little girl, maybe three, four years old. She tells him, Oh man, have you read the Quran? Subhanallah, she was just burning to death and she remembers the Quran. He says, Yes, I've read the Quran. Why? She tells him, Ya Shaykh, Hal qara'ta qawlahu ta'ala fa'ammal yatima fala taqhar. Have you read the verse that states, as for the orphan, do not oppress him? Yes, I've read this verse. Why? Why is this relevant? She tells him, Ya Shaykh, Ana yatima to Abi Abdullah al Hussein. I'm the orphan of Hussein. He says, at that point, I knew, I knew who she was. She was the daughter of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He says, then she made a peculiar request. She told him, Ya Shaykh, Tullani ala tariq al -ghari. Show me where Najaf is. I told her, Najaf? We're far from Najaf. There's nothing in Najaf. What do you want from Najaf? She says, I've heard from my aunt Zain that my grandfather Ali ibn Abi Talib is buried there. I want to go and complain to him and tell him what happened to us in Karbala. Hamid ibn Muslim, he narrates all of this. He says, I told her, come, you're dying from thirst. I took her to the river of Furat. I filled a cup for her and I gave it to her. She looked at the sweetness of the, the, the coolness, the sweetness of the water. Before she took a sip from the water, she told me, I have a question to ask you, Hamid. Be honest. The last time I saw my father Hussein, his lips were withered. Tell me by Allah, before you killed him, did you give him some water? He says, no, unfortunately, they killed him thirsty. He says, she spilled the water. She says, I shall not drink the water when my father Hussein did not drink water. He says, I, I, I feared she's going to perish. So I took her to Zainab and Zainab السلام, convinced her to drink some water. See, these stories, my dear brothers and sisters, were reported by reporters who were on the enemy's side. On the enemy's side. Even though later Hamid ibn Muslim regretted not joining Imam al Hussein and fighting alongside Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he tried to repent. He tried to regret it. But my dear brothers and sisters, Hamid ibn Muslim is condemned, is condemned by our scholars because he witnessed all these atrocities. He didn't do anything. He did not try to stop the injustice. And this is a lesson for us. He was a bystander. 
Well, I'm just doing my job. What do you mean your job? This is the Imam, the Imam of your time, the grandson of Rasulullah being massacred. Today we have this attitude, unfortunately. We have this attitude when we see something wrong, it's none of my business. Why should I get involved? Mind your own business and I'll mind my own business. My dear brothers and sisters, an act of injustice is everyone's business. Because it affects everyone. It destroys society. And when society sinks like a ship, everyone suffers. Many times we see in our families, amongst our friends, someone's being oppressed and we don't do anything about it. You see someone who's abusive, an abusive husband, an abusive parent, an abusive child, an abusive wife. Never say it's none of, it's none of my business. It is our business, my dear brothers and sisters. We have to do something about it. Do you know why an abusive husband gets away with abusing his wife for so many years? Because we don't do anything about it. Everyone says, no, it's none of my business, who cares? I remember once a lady had called me, she was suffering from an abusive husband. So I tried to call him to try to resolve this, he would not respond. I told her, I have no way to get to him. Is there any way we can speak to a, a family member? So she gave me his brother's number. I called him. I told him, look, in summary, this is the case. The wife of your brother came and she's saying that he's been abusive to her and I need to speak to him. But he's not willing to respond. So I, I want to ask you if you can get involved, please. First of all, is it true? I need to verify it, right? You have to hear the other side of the story. He says, yeah, it's true. My brother does abuse her. I said, okay, let's do something about it. He's like, no, Sayyid, he's my brother. What do you want me to do? I told him, what do you mean? You just admitted that he's abusing her. He's like, yeah, but she's not related to me. She's a stranger to me for all I know. He's my brother. And then he started to philosophize. Lahmi <laughs> udami. You know, he's, he's my blood and my flesh. You want me to stand against him? Some people have this attitude. You see someone in your own family being oppressed and you don't do anything. We become bystanders. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns the bystanders. Those who witness an act of injustice. Those who witness bullying. Our beloved youth, one of the biggest problems today in schools, in your circles is bullying. According to one study, 49% of kids, they get bullied. Whether physically, verbally, emotionally, whether at school, whether online, cyberbullying. Half of our kids are getting bullied and nobody does anything about it. Most kids, they don't do anything about it. If you want to support Imam Hussein alayhi salam, take action. That's what the story of Karbala teaches us. You see one of your friends being bullied? Do something about it. Involve the adults. If all of us collectively do that, no one will dare Oppress others. The reason why we oppress one another is because we have a green light to do so. Who's going to stop me? Don't be intimidated. Imam al Hussein salam teaches you be strong, rise. You see someone being bullied, rumors being spread around someone, someone's character being assassinated. Do something about that. That's the lesson, my dear brothers and sisters, that we learn from the story of Karbala. That is the lesson that we learn from Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. So you find that historians and journalists like Humayd ibn Muslim, they were also present there to narrate to us what happened. And finally, we have the survivors, the family of Imam Hussein, who told the world what happened. Fatima, the daughter of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, she says, after they attacked our tents, one of those enemies, he came, he started looting us, the belongings that we have, if we had jewelry, some of the outer garments that we had, they started looting them. Fatima, the daughter of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, she says, one of those enemies, as he was looting me, he was crying. I told him, Ya Adu Allah, O enemy of God, you're looting me and you're crying? How is that possible? He says, yes, because I'm looting the granddaughter of Rasulullah. He knows, he knows what he's doing. I told him, is that so? So you know I'm the granddaughter of Rasulullah, yet yeah, you loot me, how do you justify that? You know what his response was? He says, if I'm not going to loot you, somebody else will. Somebody else will. So I might as well 
get something out of this. And this is a mentality that some people have, right? Unfortunately. This is why some of the countries that we find today are struggling and they're devastated by corruption. This is their attitude. Some of these you know, politicians, you tell them, what are you doing? All this theft? Well, yeah, what am I going to do? If I don't steal, somebody else is going to steal. If my party doesn't steal, some other party is going to steal. This is the mentality of the army of Yazid. This is exactly how they justified their atrocities on the day of Ashura. So my dear brothers and sisters, this is a story that continues to move us. Let's appreciate how this story reached us. And what are the important sources for the story of Karbala. Those survivors who lived to tell the world what happened. We are indebted to them. It is through their sacrifices that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has inspired us. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided us to the right path. And today, my dear brothers and sisters, it is our responsibility to take the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and share it with the world. Poets also played a very important role. At the time, the best form of art amongst the Arabs was poetry. And the Quran, by the way, condemns those poets because they would use poetry for a vain cause. In Surah Al-Shu'ara, at the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticizes them. Usually those poets, the deviants would follow them. أَلَمْ تَرَ أَنَّهُمْ فِي كُلِّ وَادٍ يَهِيمُونَ Don't you see that these poets, they basically enter every valley. They're not grounded in any morality or ethics. They just say things to please the people or to please the kings. وَأَنَّهُمْ يَقُولُونَ مَا لَا يَفْعَلُونَ And they say things, they don't implement them. And then Allah makes an exception. No, there are some of them. They're believers, they use this form of art for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they encouraged the poets. They told them, you have to compose lines of poetry to keep the message of Imam Hussein alive. So you find the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they actually encouraged their companions to use the highest form of art in that era to convey and deliver the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And this is what we expect from our wonderful younger generation to do, my dear brothers and sisters. All of you are good at something. You have your areas of strength. Use your area of strength. Use modern art within Islamic guidelines, of course, to invite people to the path of Islam. Animation, clips, short clips, social media, you name it, plays, theatrical plays. One of my dreams is to see the play of Karbala being conducted in a place like Broadway. Do you know how many people will be touched by that? This is how to use modern art to call people to the story of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Just like the poets used that type of modern art to raise awareness about the message of Imam Hussein salawatullahi alayhi. The Imams of Ahlul Bayt on such a night, they would truly live the sadness of Karbala. Let us try to experience that grief and sadness as well. Al Imam Al Sadiq alayhi salam he states, "Kana Abi ida dakhla shahr al Muharram, la yura zahika." He says, "My father, when the crescent of Muharram would enter." He would not be seen laughing anymore. He would not be seen smiling. And he would be overcome with depression, with grief. He would be grief stricken. The Imams of Ahlul Bayt really had difficult moments on these nights. Because they would remember every detail that happened in Karbala. And whenever they were faced with a tragedy, they would remember Karbala. Once Al-Mansur Al-Abbasi ordered an attack on the house of Imam Al-Sadiq alayhi salam. The next day, one of his companions, one of the Imam's companions, he went to see him. He saw the Imam in grief, crying, abnormally grieving. He told him, Imam, this is normal for you, the Ahlul Bayt. This is not the first time that your house is attacked. 
This is not the first time that you're oppressed. Why do I see you so grief-stricken like that? The Imam السلام, told him, I'll tell you why. I am so moved by what happened yesterday. He says, yesterday when they attacked my house and they set the house to fire and the fire was spreading from one room to another room and I saw the woman and the children running from one room to another room to save their lives. I remembered my aunts in Karbala. When they would be running from one tent to another tent, when their tents were set to fire. That scene is what's making me cry. Don't think I'm crying for myself or for my own family. I'm crying for the family of my grandfather Hussein. That's how the Imams of Ahlul Bayt would live these moments and they would live these nights, my dear brothers and sisters. And they were continuing the legacy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. About 60 years before the tragedy of Karbala, the Prophet was the first one who started this tradition of crying for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Um Salama narrates, she says, One day I saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. He went to his room. He told me, Um Salama, I need some time between myself and my Lord. This is his moment of meditation with Allah. Please, I don't want you to allow anyone to disturb me. I'm going to close the door and I need these moments with my Lord. Make sure no one disturbs me in the following moments. Um Salama, the wife of the Prophet says, sure, I will do that. Suddenly, a while after Um Salama, she noticed that Imam al Hussein was running towards the room of the Prophet. She tried to stop him, thinking that he's going to disturb the Prophet, but he slipped from her arms and he went inside the room. Um Salama says, A while after, I heard the Prophet crying. She was puzzled. What happened? Is Hussein disturbing the Prophet? Why is he grieving? What happened? She says, I entered the room. I apologized. I told him, Ya Rasulullah, I couldn't stop Hussein from coming to your room. What happened, Ya Rasulullah? She says, I saw the Prophet lying on the floor and Imam Hussein sitting on the chest of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And my dear brothers and sisters, whenever, whenever I remember this scene, of young Hussein sitting on the chest of the Prophet, I cannot help but remember the words of the poet who says, Yawmun ala sadr al-Mustafa wa yawmun ala wajh thara one day on the chest of the Mustafa and one day on the plains of Karbala. She says, I saw Hussein on the chest of Rasulullah and the Prophet was sobbing. He was grieving. I told him, Ya Rasulullah, what disturbs you? Why are you crying like that? I've not seen you cry like that. He told her, Oh Um Salama, I was having a good time with my grandson Hussein. When Jibreel descended upon me, he told me, Ya Rasulullah, do you love your grandson Hussein? I said, yes, of course I love my grandson Hussein. He's a part of me, how can I not love him? He told me, Ya Rasulullah, let me tell you that one day, your ummah will kill your grandson Hussein. In the land of Karbala, they will sever his head. And then, this is narrated even in Sunni sources. And then Jibra'il told me, Ya Rasulullah, would you like to see the dust on which your grandson Hussein will be killed? He said, yes. He says, he took a handful of the dust of Karbala and he gave it to me. And here, Um Salama, I will give it to you. If one day you see this dust turn into blood, know that my grandson Hussein has been killed. My dear brothers and sisters, raise your hand in dua. This is the moment of dua. Allah has promised us with broken hearts and tears, Allah will answer our prayers. I know you all have your hajat. There are ill people who need our dua. 
This is the moment of dua when we gather as believers in these blessed majalis. Allah opens the gates of His mercy wide to us. Raise your hand in dua and let's, re let's recite this holy verse five times together. Everyone raise your hand. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Amman yujibu al-mudhtarra idha da'a wa yakshifu al-suhu. Amman. Amman yujibu al-mudhtar idha da'ahu wa yakshifu al-suhu Nas'aluka Allahumma bismika al-azz al-ajal al-akram Ya Allah 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 O oh Allah, hasten the reappearance of our master, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi. O oh Allah, make us amongst his sincere and dedicated companions. O oh Allah, all those who are ill, grant them a speedy recovery. O oh Allah, all those who are distressed, give them a speedy relief. وَإِلَىٰ أَرْوَاحِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ نُهْدِي ثَوَابَ السُّورَةِ الْمُبَارَكَةِ الْفَاتِحَةِ مسبوقة بالصلاة على محمد وآل محمد سلامتی حاج آقا سید محمد باقر غزبینی سنواد محبت بفرمون بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم یا رحمان و یا رحیم صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا ابو عبد الله وعلى الارواح التي هلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله ابدا ما بقيت و بقي الليل و النهار و لا جعل الله خير العهد مني لزيارتكم همه با السلام وعلى علي ابن ال وعلى أولاده مرا در دو مرا در من حسین است مرا اول مرا پایان حسین است دل هر کس به ایمانی سرشته مرا هم دین و هم ایمان حسین است 
همه عالم به ازن حق تعالا چو عبدی سر به فرمان حسین است بهشت و جنت و فردوس علا همه معلول پیمان حسین است برای هر دلی جانان و جانی مرا هم جان و هم جانان حسین است حسین جان حسین جان بیا و درد هجران محبان را مداوا کن نگاهی از کرم بر چشمهای بسته ما کن تمام آفرینش بی تو باشد جسم بی جانی بیا با یک نگه بر خلق اجاز مسیحا کن بیا از غربت جدت بگو با مردم آله بیا و چشم ما را از سرش که سرخ دریا کن بیا دست ید اللهی برون از آستین آور تناب خسم را از دست های امت با کن کنار الغم با مادر مظلوم از زهرا دو چشم خیش را دریا به یاد چشم سقا کن سر بالای نی آوای قرآن خنده شادی بیا در بازه ساعت دو زینب را تماشا کن بیا با عشق کن همچون اموی خیش سقایی بریز از دید خون و گریه بر اولاد زهرا کن آج آقا سمیر انشاءالله مرسیه رو میخونم ولی چون شب اول محرمه من خیلی دلم میخواد این مطلب رو سریع بگم اول اینجا هیچ کدوممون بیده اود نیمدیم عزیزان خدا میدونه توفیقی که خداوند به همه ما داده همه حاجت داریم مریض داریم درد داریم حاجت مندن گرفتارایان خیلی زیادن هر کدومونم گرفتاری خاص خودمونو داریم و خداوند به همه ما و قلبای همه ما آگاهه امشب که شب اوله بیایم یه قولی به امام حسین بدیم یه تغییری بکنیم نسبت به گذشتمون نقل میکنن تو شهر یزد یه سری نوجوان ها خواستن که خیمه بزنن توی کوچه ای توی گوشه کوچه ای اونجا خیمه امام حسین رو بزنن مجلس بگیرن پول نداشتن پول نداشتن مجلس بگیرن پول نداشتن روزه خون و مدده بیارن یکی از تجارای یزد متوجه شد گفت شما نگران نباشید فقط بگید چقدر میخواید من چکو مینویسم دست چکو دار اینا هم استفاده کردن یه مبلغ بالایی نوشتن وقتی مبلغ رو نوشتن تاجر روش رو برگردون فقط امضا کرد امضا کرد داد دست اونا اونا هم خوشحال شدن رفتن گفت فقط مجلس رو بسیار با اصول و با برکت بگیرید این تاجر گذشت مدتی فوت کرد در عالم خواب دیدنش گفتن که تاجر اونجا چه خبر؟ گفت نمیدونم من وقتی نامه اعمالم آوردن دستش رسید اون نامه اعمالم به امام حسین آقا روشو برگردون فقط امضای بهشت منو دا اگه میخوای با امام حسین معامله کنی اینجوری معامله کنی شب اوله اگه دل شکست اگه اتصال پیدا کرد بگیریم بگیریم برای دیگرون به دل دارم شوق روی تو را اتر بوی تو را ای حبیب من شده مجنون گوش گیر غمد زار و پیر غمد ای طبیب من 
به عشق لیلا شدم مجنون مرا با دوری مکن دل خود یوسف زهرا یوسف زهرا یوسف زهرا از اش از میان حسینی خدا آمد صدای ناله حی علال عزا جمع ملائک همه گریان شدند و بعد گفتند تسلیت همه بر ساحت خدا حسین جان باز هنگام ما تم شده ایشان قریب باز هنگام ما تم شده ایشان قریب دل دیوان پر از غم دل دیوان پر از غم شده شاه قریب باز در عرش خدا مشکی ما تب زده موسم بیرق و پرچم شده شاه غریب کربلا گفتم و اوزا دلم ریخ به هم میدونم الان همه شما دلتون کربلا است و خواست این ده شب و تا عربین هم همونجه بمونید I know all your hearts are in Karbala and you wish to be there right now and to mourn with other people who are very close to the haram. But as long as the hearts are attached, the souls are attached with Imam Hussein, inshallah we will get the rewards for it. Karbala goftam oza edelam rikh baham کربلا قبله عالم شده ای شاه قریب آه سقا چه کند با اتش اهل حرم آه سقا چه کند با اتش اهل حرم آب در خیمه تان کم شده ای شاه غریب به ابی انت و امی چه شده در گودان به ابی انت و امی چه شده در گودان کمر خوهرتان خم شده شاه غریب شب اول محرم میدونم همه آماده بودید برای امشب از قبل هم همیشه مطمئنا نزدیک محرم که میشه میدونید دلا میگیره و اون کسانی که دلشون حسینی غم تمام وجودشون رو میگیره لباس سیاه تهیه میکنن خودشون رو آماده میکنن برای عزاداری سید شهدا 
امشب منصوبه به سفیر کربلا به سفیر سید و شهدا مسلم به عقیله بعد از پیکار خیلی عظیمی مسلم خیلی شجاع بوده روایت نوشتن از یک آلمانی من کتابش رو میخوندم میگفت ساعتها میخواستن مسلم به عقیل رو دستگیر کنن نمیتونستن دست مسلم رو از پشت بستن او را به دار الاماره آوردن همان که چشمش به چشم عبید الله ابن زیاد افتاد مسلم ابن عقیل مسلم ابن عقیل شروع به گریه کرد کرد در کرد مسلم ابن عقیل شروع به گریه کردن کرد عبید الله لعین گفت از مرگ می ترسی فهمیدی دستگیر شدی از مرگ می ترسی مسلم ابن عقیل فرمود نه والله برای خودم گریه نمی کنم برای امامم حسین ابن علی گریه می کنم من برای اون آمه نوشتم که مردم کوفه آماده اند حسین سری خودتو به کوفه برسان ای کاش ای کاش زن بچه هاش با خودش نیاره وقتی خواستن ممست ابن ابن عقی رو به شهادت برسونن گفت من سه وسیعت دارم وسیعت تو چیز گفت اول همه این است که اگر مرا شهید کردید بدنم را روی خاک ها نگذارید مرا دفت کنید وسیعت دوم هم این است که من قرض دارم 700 درهم 700 دینار به یکی قرض دارم قرض مرا به اون شخص تحویل بدید وصیت سومم هم این است که یکی از شما یک نامه به سید و مولایم بنویسه بگه حسین جان به کوفه نیا مردم به تو خیانت می کند مردم کوفه بی وفاید همه صدا بزنید یا حسین یا حسین یا حسین کاش می شد خبرم نزد تو سا کاش می شد خبرم نزد تو آقا برسد کاش می شد خبرم نزد تو آقا برسد خبر تشنگی کوز به دریا برسد یا حسین جانم ای حسین جانم ای حسین جانم ای حسین جانم ای کاش می شد که نیایی به سر شیر خدا کاش می شد که نیایی به سر شیر خدا تل خواهد شد اگر زینبت اینجا برسد تل شد تل خواهد شد اگر زینبت اینجا برسد ای حسین جان ای حسین یه بار دیگه ای حسین جانم در پی دوستی هر مله با هر مله ها در پی دوستی هر مله با هر مله ها 
سند خارت گهوار به امضا برسد سند این خارت گه بار به امزا برسد ای حسین با حجومی که من امروز از این ها دیدم با حجومی که من امروز از این ها دیدم روز سختی است اگر قارت فردا برسد روز سختی است اگر قارت فردا برسد ای حسین جانم ای حسین جانم نگرانم به خدا من چنین میگویم نگرانم به خدا من چنین میگویم نکند آتش پیکان به زنها برسد نکند آتش پیکان به زنها برسد ای حسین جانم شهر جز جان یا قتال ندارد برگر شهر جز جان یا قتال ندارد برگر خواهرت طاقت گودال ندارد برگر خواهرت طاقت گودال ندارد برگر ای حسین جانم ای حسین ای حسین جان ای حسین جانم ای حسین جانم حسین غریب مادر حسین غریب مادر حسین غریب مادر حسین غریب مادر همه حسین غریب مادر حسین غریب مادر حسین غریب حسین غریب مادر را وا کنید که زهرا با قامت خمومت را وا کنید که زهرا با قامت خمومت ناله کشید بنیه ماه محرم اومد شال ازای ماتم روشونه ها من افتاد زهرا خودش دوباره دنبال من فرستاد حسین غریب مادر حسین غریب مادر مادر دوباره امسال در زده خونمونا مادر دوباره امسال در زده خونمونا به اسمی شناسه دونه به دونمونا با چشم دل ببینی کنار در نشسته با چشم دل ببینید کنار در نشسته هی میزنه به سینه با بازوی شکسته هی میزنه به سینه با بازوی شکسته حسین غریب ماده حسین غریب ماده بوی حرم گرفتیم از عطرسی به مادر 
تا ما میگیم حسین جان میگه غریب مادر بوی حرم گرفتیم از اترسی به مادر تا ما میگیم حسین جان میگه غریب مادر حسین غریب مادر حسین غریب هی زیر لب میخونه شمشی را تیر آوردن هی زیر لب میخونه شمشی را تیر آوردن بچم رو مثل من هم غریبی را بردن بچم رو مثل من هم غریب گیر آوردن بچم رو مثل من هم نامرد بی حوازد بچم رو مثل من هم نامرد بی حوازد گودال بود و بچم لب تشن دست و پازد گودال بود و بچم لب تشن دست و پازد حسین غریب به مادر 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 حسین غریب مادر recite this five ayah, to five times this ayah for the recovery, speedy recovery of all those people who are ill today, for those who couldn't make it today at the hospital bed, for those who have many calamities and problems. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them all speedy recovery and grant our prayers, inshallah, for all of us, for ourselves and them as well. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim 
اشفي كل مريض اللهم اشفي مرضانا وارحم موتانا اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الابرار الهي والسيد اغفر لنا ذنوبنا جميعا واشفي مرضانا يا رب العالمين اللهم عجل في فرج مولانا صاحب الزمان واجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره والمستشهدين بين يدي بار پروردگار آقا سمت میدهیم فرج نازنین آقا امام زمان تعجیل بفرما قلب نازنین محبوب مولا را از همه ما راضی و خوشنود بگردان خدایا ما را مشمول دعاهای خیر آقا امام زمان قرار بده به عزت و جلالت ثوابی از این مجلس بیریا به ارواح پدران ما مادران ما زبن حقوق حق داران واصل و نائل بگردان خدایا حاجت حاجت مندان مخصوصا حاضرین این جمع برابرده به خیر بگردان بار پروردگارا انبات این جمع غریر رحمتت بفرما به عزت و جلالت بیماران جهان بیماران اسلام همه اونهایی که انتماس دعا گفتن از سائل ما صافیت برقامت همه آنها بپوشاد خدایا قسمت می دهیم اسامی ما رو در دفتر زاکرین آقا با عبدالله سبت و زب بفرما اخلاق و رفتار و پندار حسینی و عمل فضلی به همه ما عنایت بفرما جوونهای ما رو در کنف وجود مقدس آقا امام زمان محافظت بفرما خدایا تا ما رو نیا مرزی از دار فانی به دار باقی مبد به نبی و آل نسیار جمعی مؤمنین و مؤمنات به اخص مرحومه مغفوره با نو غمر جانشاهی نیکنف و جمعی مؤمنین و مؤمنات این جمع جمعی مؤمنین و مؤمنات این جمع رحم الله من غره الفاتحه تمه از سلوات